population is and needs to be at the heart of our uh, struggle to tackle the environmental crisis. And um, on that note, I would very much like to introduce uh, Barry Gardner. Um, uh, it's been really heartening, incredibly heartening to see um, the tides turn um, on some of the policies of the neoliberalism that seem to be dominating our world of far, far. I didn't have any of these um, when it started. Um, so it's really heartening to see the tides turn um, on the land. It's also been really heartening in the last, in the last few months, in the last year, to see some fantastic pictures. Um, from people like uh, like people like Barry at the um, uh, front edge team uh, from generally recently speaking about climate as a central issue and a central policy issue for the local so that would go to you. You've got ten minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> You said it was my birthday this morning, right? And it is. And shall I tell you what my worst birthday present was? Okay? My worst birthday present was a telephone call at 9.30 from Liam Fox. Oh. <laughs> I, I thought I wasn't going to make it on time. I had to phone up and say, I'm probably not going to get there on time because I've got to take this telephone call. But I want to talk to you about the telephone call. Um, because it connects up with precisely why we're here. And it goes right back to what you said at the beginning about the way in which Trump had approached the 2016 general election in the US. Because Fox was turning me up, he was turning me up about the, the situation at the moment with the steel industry. And you will have seen that America is putting a 25% tariff on uh, steel imports uh, into the US, 10% tariff on aluminium, or as they call it, aluminium. Um, and you've got to say, well, why is it that he's doing this? Why is he doing this? And he's doing this because there is exactly that commu those communities, not that, those communities, in America, the Rust Belt communities, who look at the changes that have been going on in their world, the changes as a result of globalization, and the changes that have come and impacted on their lives, and more than their lives, their whole communities, the way the Rust Belt lives. And the interesting thing is this, what Trump has done is he's identified a genuine global problem which is oversupply, overcapacity within the steel industry. And you ask any of our steel unions, <coughs> like the union, all of them say exactly this, there is global overcapacity. Trouble is, his response to that overcapacity is entirely wrong. It's that protectionist response that he's got to, which will ultimately damage his own people and his own communities. But those communities are the ones who, I can't remember the name of the union leader, I was trying to, trying to Google it actually, but when I Googled it, all I got was some uh, funeral parts. Neil Gerard. Neil Gerard? Of the steel workers. Uh, no, uh, well, I don't think it was the steel workers. The one I'm thinking of is the one who said about the Keystone Pipeline and about Obama's efforts to climate change. It was in the context of talking about the Keystone Pipeline. And he said about, uh, he said about climate change, that it is an invitation to a fancy funeral. An invitation to a fancy funeral. And that precisely represents the gap in understanding between many, many people in this world, not just in America, but many people in the world, between the sense of, we've got our jobs to protect, We've got our livelihoods and our communities to protect. And all these people who are talking about, you know, climate change and the environment, all they're doing is inviting us to a fancy funeral. And the real political challenge that we have is how do we move 
to fill that gap. How, let me just ask you a question here. And I think I probably know the answer, unfortunately. How many people here are card-carrying members of the Conservative Party? <laughs> you, you laugh. That's a problem. That's a problem. Because there are a large group of people in our society who don't get it, who don't understand. And the political job that we've got to do is to move them so that they realize, and it is the process of just transition. It's absolutely about understanding the interconnectedness of this and the way in which we can be moving from a situation in which the jobs that people see going are no longer a threat. And I, the next politician I wrote down when I was sitting there is Jonathan Pershing. <coughs> I wrote Fox, Trump, Pershing. And Jonathan Pershing, you may know, he was uh, the climate advisor to, to Obama. And I remember sitting down with him at the Paris conference um, just after Trump had been elected, but before Trump had become the president, you know, in that sort of interstice period between the December and the January. And I, I, I just started the meeting and said, I said, Jonathan, you, you must just be so depressed seeing all the work that you've done, you know, just going to be thrown in the, in the trash can. I use trash can. <laughs> um, and he looked at me and said, no, he said, I'm not depressed. I'm not depressed because actually it's no longer up to the federal government alone. And it is the states and it is business that are going to be driving this forward. It's the cities. And he talked about the way in which in those Rust Belt communities, Actually, in Texas, uh, Kansas, all those areas which you know we think of traditional fossil fuel areas, there were now actually more jobs connected with wind than there were with fossil fuels. <coughs> and the point is that we. I've only got five minutes. I've got to speed up because I've got a heck of a lot of things to say. Um, the point is that actually, as we see the costs of technology come down, which they have amazingly, I mean, you will all remember two years ago when we were talking 120 pounds per megawatt hour for offshore wind, 57.5 now, 57.5. Uh, anybody remember what Hinkley is? <laughs> 92. I, uh, as I re referenced the, the announcement I made at the Labour Party conference two years ago um, when we said that we were going to ban fracking. And I was at least there recently, it's great to see the methods in the um, And uh, why? Why did we, why were we able to move from the position where we said, we have 13 amendments to table to the infrastructure bill that was going through the House, all of which were about environmental safety and security and technology. Why were we able to move from that to a ban? Because, and, and let's face it, the Tories said that they were going to implement some of those amendments that we put through, and they didn't. But it wasn't just because they didn't. It was because Paris changed the whole game. The world agreed on the target of getting as close to 1.5 as we possibly could, of going to net zero by the second half of the century. And in order to do that, if you want to be responsible, and I'm talking about responsibility to business as well, then what you do is you say, look, this is the target. We are going to ban this. Now, if you want to make your investment on the basis of knowing that the Labour government is going to come in and ban it, that's up to you. Don't, don't. Don't say we didn't warn you. Don't say we didn't give you, 
you know, full disclosure, and that suddenly we're doing something that is retrospectively, you know, going to affect your investment and your return on your capital. And talk about return on capital, and again, picking up from what you think. Isn't it incredible that we now have a governor of the Bank of England who is talking about stranded assets, who's talking about financial stability, being about recognizing not the physical, not the environmental risks, not the social risks from climate change, but the financial risks from climate change. Because hands up in this room, all those who have a pension. Well, you know. <laughs> those pension funds, those pension funds absolutely depend on financial stability. And of course, the biggest instability for those pension funds is the stranded assets, the fact that, you know, we put five times as much fossil fuel reserves identified in the world as we can possibly use if we're going to reach the 1.5. So, what's the next? Oh, I wanted to talk about agriculture. I wanted to talk about boat. I wanted to talk about electricity and transport. Transport, you know. Don't be fooled. Okay. Yet another politician's name. Go. Don't be fooled. Right? How, how sickening. The way in which, you know, some people in the environmental mood have gone, oh, gaga. You know, because Michael Gove comes out and says, by 2040, we will have stopped all sales of, of fossil fuel vehicles. By 2040? Volvo are saying they're going to do it, they're not going to be producing anymore by 2020. Norway are banning them, new sales of new vehicles from 2025. Germany, Holland by 2030. 2040 isn't even business as usual. The scale of the challenge that we face in transition in the shortest period of time that we've ever had to make such a major technological shift, social shift, is absolutely startling. And we have to face up to that. But we also have to recognize that we're not going to get anywhere unless we can bridge that divide. Unless we can have stuff in this room, 40% of the audience being Tories, right? And because actually, it's the same for all of us. And if we're going to do that, we need to have the renewables industries unionized. Because one of the biggest pushbacks against the announcement I made in 2016 actually came from the union that I have to be a member of, the GMB. Proud member. I will stop. No, no. no. One. Yeah. Right. Um, and there was a big pushback because, of course, they represent the interests of workers in the gas industry, it, you know, it, fossil fuel is part of the livelihood of that, that union. They represent workers in Hinkley C. So how are you going to get the full support of all the unions in this country unless the renewables industries are unionized? And that's a huge challenge for us as well. But if we're going to get a just transition, that's an essential part of it. And look, there's so many things I, 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 I noted down here that I wanted to say. Final two things. One, you don't do this top down. You don't do this top down. It's not about government setting out policy. Of course, government has to. It has to create that regulatory framework. That's what Paris was about. And why Paris worked when Copenhagen failed was precisely in Copenhagen, <coughs> people got together and they said, you ought to do this, you have to do that, you country are doing this wrong, you country are doing that wrong. At Paris, we said, let's have your contributions. 
Let's see your INDCs, your intended nationally determined contributions. Let's do both bottom up and top down. And that enabled us to create a regulatory framework which was inclusive. The conversations have to be inclusive. That means they have to be going <coughs> along in all of our communities from the bottom up. That's the way you'll get people buying in because they don't feel their community is being left behind. That's why the energy vendor was successful in Germany because communities were involved. Communities saw the benefit of localized energy under their own public ownership. I, I haven't even started on this conversation. I want to finish then with one thing, um, and that is the Sustainable Development Goals. Can anybody please quote to me, part of you, <laughs> quote me number eight of the Sustainable Development Goals. So no Tories and nobody who can quote number eight of the Sustainable Development Goals. To promote sustained inclusive and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. It's superb. It's superb. And the best thing about the SDGs, so much better than the old Millennium Development Goals, is quite simply this. The Millennium Development Goals were again that old model. They were the top down, they were, we're going to, in the, in, the, in, the, in the global north, do this to you, the global south. We, the rich world, are going to tell you, the poor world, how to do things. The sustainable development goals are universal. It means that they are about what you do in your own society, in your own community, as much as what you've been able to happen elsewhere in the world. It's, that's the model. It's a model that recognizes our own failings. It's a model that takes that seriously. It's a model about inclusivity. And it's a model that actually will enable us to bridge not just the divide between the Rust Belt in America and the progressive people in America. Not just the divide between people in this country who are fearful for their jobs and who want to see where their future lies. But actually that spreads right across the world precisely the way that you were talking about, that actually says climate change is not simply about our energy policy. It's not simply about our environment policy. It's not simply about mitigation of flooding. It's not simply about agriculture in the future. It's about justice. It's about justice. Very simple. If you want peace in the world, create justice. If you want justice, live sustainably.